cross-linking. So protein-protein cross-linking is a way that you can capture proteins um, as they're interacting. Um, and this gives you inform can give you information about where they're interacting and what they're interacting with, as well as helping like stabilize the um, interacting partners in order to try to use like structural biology techniques like cryo-electron microscopy or crystallography to try to study the complex. You can think of it kind of as turning a protein into a mouse trap. And so basically you proteins are these long chains of amino acid letters that they fold up and these letters have different properties and there's one of these letters lysine. Um and so uh, it has this prop this um amino group that can react with the cross-linking agent. And these cross-linking agents are kind of like bifunctional. So they have a, a group, they have like a trap at, at both ends. So like each of my hands would be a mouse trap. They would trap one thing. So they trap the protein that the lysine has. So the lysine on one protein is going to get trapped by the mouse trap. But then this molecule still has this other mouse trap over here. And so this mouse trap is going to trap a lysine. It could be on a different place in the same protein or on a different protein. It all has to depend on the proximity and the space between my hands, between those mouse traps. So like the spacer length. The important thing with cross-linking is these are covalent bonds. So these involve actual like electron pair sharing. So these are like the kind of bonds that pull together the chains of amino acids in the protein. I mean, they're not, like exactly but I mean the type those are all covalent bonds and so they those are strong bonds as opposed to non covalent bonds which are more just like attractions so like based on like charge and partial charge and just like temporary fleeting partial charges um all this stuff where basically those things come apart and come on and off and so it's kind of like you can take your glove on and off but you can't like take your fingers on and off so like my fingers are connected to my hands and my hand is connected to my wrist. These are all covalent bonds, but my cape is non-covalently bonded to me. I can take it on and off. I can take it on and off. And so sometimes things are more tight. Um, so like um, my shoes are on more tightly, but I can still take them off. So some molecular interactions are tighter or like stronger affinity than others. And so those strong affinity ones, you don't really need to worry usually about like cross-linking for the structural purposes. Um, but you can still use cross-linking to try to get information about positional information about where things are interacting, especially because with like tech cryo EM, you often get like this blobby thing and then you're trying to like figure out like what's what in the blob. Um, and so if you have this like space or information about how far apart different parts are, um, that could give you information about how to orient. Like maybe you have crystal structures you're trying to like dock into the cryo EM structure and you're like, I don't even know which part of this is which protein. Then if you have um, like cryo EM from information you can figure out like oh this part interacts with this part so this probably fits here and here and you can like kind of piece things together but so you can do that by using like different spacer links um and trying different spacer links um to try to get information about the link between things cross linkers often are like these nhs esters um so basically these parts are like your mouse traps but they're actually going to come off when the lysine attacks so lysine um it's off, usually protonated, but it can get deprotonated. And now this nitrogen has this lone pair of electrons and it's a strong nucleophile. What this means way more on other posts, but this means that basically it's going to seek out electrophiles, which are atoms that have, um, that are looking for electrons. This nitrogen has a lone pair of electrons and it's looking for um, some help with um, like taking that load. So it's going to attack this carbonyl carbon. So basically this oxygen is pulling the electrons away. Just know that it's making this part, um, this electrophilic, and this is nucleophilic. And when you have a nucleophile and an electrophile, they like to come together. When they come together, they can push out, they can kick off this NHS, this NHS part like this. And now you have this connected through an amide bond and now you still have this mouse trap available. So if there's a lysine on another amino acid, then you can have that same thing happen. And then they're going to be connected by the crosslinker. And so something like this, where you have like DSG, so disosinidyl middle glutarate. So this part's the NHS ester. So an ester is where you have like 
a double bond O uh, next to an O. It's an ester group. Um, and so when you have it on the end of something, it can interact with the lysine. So the lysine um, can nucleophilically attack the oxygen. Um, then that'll come back down. You have, you end up with this. So you have an amide group. And then the NHS will have left as your leaving group. Um, the NHS will have left. And so, yeah, so this is now happy and this is now linked. And if you have another group here, you have like your another mouse trap here, now it can go and it can attack something else. You can also have um, NHS esters react with the N-terminus of proteins. That's the other place where you have um, a primary amine group that's capable of doing this reaction. So it has that lone pair um, and it's just nucleophilic. Um, and so it's kind of like the lysine is similar to the end of every protein. Um, and so every protein has that one at least um, group. So even if it didn't have lysines anywhere, it would still have that one. So you can also get this like N-terminal labeling. You can use different links of crosslinkers to try to get information about the spacing between the lysines that you were trapping. So these could be between, remember this could be like spacing, this could be on the same um, protein chain, like a single protein, like within the protein intramolecular or they could be between different proteins, so intermolecular. Um, and so you can use different spacers to try to get information about how far apart these, um, these various amino acids are. Um, and so you could do that using like mass spectrometry. So typically when you do it like that, you have this, you can use these like special spacers. And so this is um, DSSO and it has this, um, this group here that will actually break up in the mass spec. And so I'll show you more about it later. But basically, you can take your protein mixture and you can cross-link it with this. And then you can cut your protein mixture up into pieces, so pep little peptide pieces, and then use mass spectrometry to figure out the mass and the sequence of those pieces. And you can do it in like two steps so that you isolate the cross-linked ones and then you figure out the mass of the cross-links thing. Like, so it'd be like two peptides, like one from what, this protein, one from this protein, and they're cross-linked together. Then you can figure out like the mass of that, figure out, and then break it apart using that cleavable part. Now break it apart, now figure out the mass of those individual pieces, figure out the identity of those individual pieces, and then figure out, oh, this was connected to here. So there's a ton of things you can do with like cross-linking mass spectrometry. A lot of people in the, our lab have used cross-linking um, to try to stabilize complexes for like cryo-electron microscopy, which is a technique and we use, which we use this fancy dancy electron microscope um, um, to like take pictures of molecules um, doing their business. Um, so like with crystallography, you have to get the molecules to like freeze in place. And so some molecules don't like to do that, especially if you have like big complexes and stuff. But cryo is really good for this because um, so the you can just like take their picture as they are. Um, so the cryo is like cryogenic. So basically you vitrify the samples. So you like freeze them in this like glass of ice um, and they're all happy and hanging out. And then you just um, use this electron microscope. And the reason why you have to use an electron microscope instead of a light microscope is they're so teeny, teeny, tiny that the wavelengths of visible light are like way too big. They're just gonna like float over them. So you need really, really tiny waves so that you actually see, uh, be able to see the really, really tiny details. Even though cryo is often able to um, visualize, let you visualize complexes better than Electri um, then crystallography because with cryo you aren't requiring all of the different pieces and everything to lock it in place in the same place and it's repeating pattern everywhere so you get a lot of these things like in different positions and then you kind of like try to take the averages of all these all these millions and millions of particles and stuff and yeah so there, it's a lot of computational stuff but 
you, in order to try to do all that computational stuff, you have to have this complex form to begin with. And sometimes the complexes, so when we talk about complexes, like so proteins can be hanging out with other proteins um, and they can have like different strengths of interactions. And so sometimes they're like really strong interactions, like they're always, almost always together. And then sometimes they're like transient interactions. So they're just like moving around. Sometimes they're coming together, sometimes they're apart. And so to really capture that type of transient interaction so that you're actually capturing it um, with your structural biology techniques, you can use cross-linking. So you can use these um, like tr these reagents in order to link together the, um, the proteins. It's also super duper important that your buffer does not have um, amine groups in it. So no tris, no glycine, um, like, I'm so I'm using Hebe's, um, and then you actually quench the reaction. Um, you can quench it with tris um, and glycine and lysine to give it a ton of um, other amino groups to react with. Um, but you don't want them doing that when you want them reacting with your protein. Um, so you can like quench it at different time points and just at different time points for concentrations and that sort of thing to find the right balance. But if you just want to like stabilize the complex, then your goal there is to get a stable like complex without getting like bazillions of oodles of like non-specific tons and tons of clumpy stuff. So there are different crosslinkers and they have different strengths. So like I'm trying out like glutaraldehyde, which is like super strong. So I'm trying it at like 0.01% because yesterday I tried 0.05% and like right away it was like almost all in stuck in the wells of my SDS page because it had all like aggregated and stuff. Although you can see like a really high up band that was like molecular weight was predicted like way higher than the proteins I was working with um, and what should have been. Um, so basically, this crosslinker is because it's you're adding these like mouse traps everywhere. So you have these mouse traps and you're flying around on all the lysines. And so proteins have like can have a lot of lysines. So typically, um, lysines because they're normally like positively charged, and even if they're not, they're still like hydrophilic, so they're water like and so they kind of hang out. They tend to hang out on the outside of proteins, and so they're going to be. In a, they're going to come into contact with more stuff and they're going to be all over the place and so you can have think of having a lot a lot of random cross-linking um, just like from these fleeting interactions and so you're trying to capture a lot of times like a fleeting interaction but not you don't want to just like capture like random fleeting interactions you want to capture like the meaningful ones so they need to be a little more than fleeting um, and so you don't want to get like so you could have the so maybe you like first form your complex that you want to form between like protein A and protein B, but then you form like protein A B B A B A and you just get these big clumps of stuff and then that's not useful. So oftentimes with like structural biology, what you actually do is after you form these complexes, you then like purify out the one that you want. So you can use like size exclusion chromatography, which we've talked about, where you. Um, separates like proteins based on their size going through this column and so you can like isolate the portion that actually has the complex that you want um, as opposed to like those huge old complexes or complexes between protein B and protein B instead of protein B and protein A or whatever. Um, so there's also things like graphics we have like a gradient of a um, crosslinker and then you um, it's like a sucrose gradient so you're like traveling versus based on like size and through the fixative and so then you can like yeah it's really cool i haven't tried it yet but we have one um but yeah so basically i've been trying out some different cross linkers because i'm trying out some i've just been experimenting with some stuff um crossing cross linking off of my biochemistry bucket list um and so yeah so i don't have like a formal post or anything um like on this uh, i'll probably do a more formal post on all of this um, with mechanisms and all of that but today I just wanted to talk about it because I've been thinking a lot about it because I've been doing it a lot and I wanted to share with you so there are a lot of other uses for um, cross-linking you might have heard of like bioconjugation that's basically where you connect different things and so the cross-linkers that um, I've been talking about so the cross-linkers um, that I've been using are like Homo bifunctional. So they have like two a mouse trap on either arm, like a mouse trap on either hand.
There's also like hetero bifunctional, where they have a mouse trap on one hand and like an ant trap on the other hand. So in biological terms, sometimes they have like a lysine reactive group, like an NHS ester on one arm, on one hand, and then the other, they'll have like a malleide uh, group, which reacts with cysteines. Um, and so off, you can often do things where you like conjugate, so you covalently link these like one, uh, Thing to one protein and you can use that, that protein as like a bait or something and then that protein um so sometimes you can have them like photo activatable so um you have this one thing which you have your bait then you activate the mouse trap so you put that cheese on there um with uv light and then it can react to something um so you can get more like specific conjugation and you can do conjugate this um sort of thing like in cross-linking inside of cells and stuff and there's all sorts of fancy tricks um you can also just like conjugate things like if you want to add a fluor force or a fluorescent molecule so you could have a fluorescent molecule attached to something with like an nhs group or something with the malate group for cysteine cross-linking um so these you can use this for like bio conjugation um but what i'm focusing on more in this post is on like the structural biology type of stuff um and how we can um, take advantage of cross-linking in order to gain information about where proteins are interacting with each other, what proteins are interacting with each other, um, the various like spatial constraints of a protein, um, which parts of a protein are near which parts of a protein, um, that sort of thing, uh, because that's what I've been thinking about and um, learning about. And sorry, this post is not well formatted. I don't have text or anything. Um, I'll provide some links. Um, hey, I'll also provide some cross-link links.